Imagine this is you. Imagine that everything you have, everything you believe is about to be taken from you, including your life. Your only hope of escape and starting a new life leaves from the top floor of this building. For the people of Saigon, this was their reality. On April the 30th, 1975, for some people, new life was waiting at the top of this ladder. But each person trying to escape, every flight was the last flight out. This is Vietnam. Everyone loves a good comeback story. My name is Mikey K. For 20 years, I flew combat helicopters into war zones, badlands, lost worlds. Now, I'm on a different mission, to change the perception of places knocked down and counted out. Oh. By going in and meeting the incredible people who never gave up, at the world's edge. Vietnam. For many, it's not a place, it's a war. One long, complicated, violent war etched in our collective pop cultural cranium through countless movies and soundtracks. For some, it's a far off country that conjures up vague images of rice paddies, communism, and families fleeing. But in reality, today, it's none of that. In fact, it's the total opposite. Vietnam today is a dynamic, modern, vibrant country. One of the world's fastest growing economies, boiling over with renegade artists, bulldozing startups, and arguably the best food on the planet. All to the backdrop of thousands of years of history, stunning scenery, and a giant new generation of young people who know nothing of napalm and love the smell of money in the morning. I'm coming to Vietnam to see what this country is all about today, and I'm starting in the south, in Ho Chi Minh City. I'm hot, I'm jet-lagged, and I'm tired from the flight. But rather than hiding in the hotel with iced coffee, I'm here at a parade that is basically celebrating Vietnam whooping America's ass. You see, it's the 40th anniversary of the liberation of Vietnam from American forces, or Reunification Day, as they like to call it around here. People I've talked to in the South aren't thrilled with this parade because they don't like the fact that the North won the war. So far, what I'm seeing doesn't necessarily align to what my perceptions would be of a Communist Day parade. I've just seen a load of sunflowers and I was expecting tanks. It's more superpower half-time show than a Stalinist display of strength. So what is this place today? What has it become? That's what I'm here to find out. I'm starting my journey here, in the south, in Ho Chi Minh City, what used to be called Saigon. I'm working my way steadily north to Hanoi, what was the center of operations for the communist forces during the war. But before I leave Saigon, I want to talk to someone with a perspective not too far from my own. Koa was just a young child during the war. His father was a fighter pilot working with America. With the fall of Saigon, Koa evacuated to California with his mother. Now, 40 years later, he has returned to Vietnam to start a new life. I wonder if the animosity from the war between the North and the South still lives on today. Tell me what it was like the first time you came back. Uh, the first time I came back was really just uh, mind-blowing. <laughs> you know, you've heard so many stories about Vietnam and the war and, and things. And here, for the first time, we were seeing everything. And I just felt... Um, um, an immediate connection. Is there any friction or animosity between the families that decided to leave and managed to evacuate versus those that either made the decision to stay or, or had to stay? 
I haven't seen a whole lot of that. You know, I think the Vietnamese people are very warm and, and open, respectful, very receptive. Uh, the young people, you know, a, a large majority of the population here are very young. And I think they're eager to, to meet foreigners, to learn, you know, different things. And they, I've seen no friction or animosity with regards to the past. I think it, it's strictly, you know, in the past. 1975. It may not seem like that long ago if you've got your nose in a geology book, but when it comes to the people, 40 years is an age. Or a generation. Or maybe two. Around 75% of the population of Vietnam is too young to remember the war. Too young to harbor a grudge or too young to care about what their grandparents or our grandparents were doing four or five decades ago. I want to bury myself deeper into this country to learn more about the changes that have happened since the war. And to do that, I need to leave Saigon and head north. And I'm going by train on the Reunification Express. In a modern world where travel is filled with lost luggage, endless security lines and awful aeroplane food, there's something very romantic and thrilling about taking a train. It's a great way to see the country, slow and old school. But for me, it's the calm before the storm. Because I'm heading inland to the Quang Tri province to meet an extraordinary team of people who are, in every sense of the word, the bomb. These experts are saving thousands of lives with nothing but brains and courage. So why on earth are they putting my finger on the button? Take cover, take cover. Oh, sit, sit, sit now, OK? Oh! In Vietnam, the preferred means of getting around in cities and in towns is the scooter, with a few exceptions. But if you're traveling more than 50 miles, the preferred way of getting around is this. The French brought a unified rail system to Vietnam in the early 20th century. But thanks to the war and unrest from World War II until the end of the Vietnam War, you were more likely to find bomb craters on the tracks than sleeper cars. After the war, in the name of reunification and national symbolism, the rail line was rebuilt and dubbed the Reunification Express. And once again, a rail line connecting Hanoi to Saigon or Ho Chi Minh City is the preferred way of getting around. I'm taking this train a little further north to one of the hottest of hotspots during the Vietnam War. And luckily for me, I have two companions who are joining me for the journey. They have a remarkable story from the war. But it's not one about guns and bombs and enemies. It is, in fact, a love story. We loved each other and did not think much about the details, as we were constantly in life and death situations. Mr. and Mrs. Fong have been married for 50 years. They fell in love while fighting together for the North during the war, but their fledgling romance was doused when Mr. Fong was sent away on assignment. For the next three years, Mrs. Fong had no idea of the whereabouts of her lover, whether he was alive or whether she would ever see him again. Can you describe to me the moment when you met after not seeing each other for three years? It was like heaven arranged that to happen. I didn't even know that he had been reassigned back to my division. Of course, for the wedding, there was no restaurants or fancy clothes, only military uniforms. No fancy ballroom either. We were in the middle of a field in Cambodia. We used cargo parachutes to decorate, and that was it. It was wonderful. Military uniforms, paratrooper gear to class it up, and a honeymoon in the Cambodian killing fields. It'd be a pretty hard sell for the editors of a wedding magazine, but for the Fongs, it was reality of life in wartime. And as difficult and as awful as it was, without that war, they never would have met. 
Without the war, they would have never got married, had children or grandchildren. Without the war, they never would have fallen in love. Is there any anger in your heart when you meet Americans now or think about what happened during the war? No. Now when I encounter Americans, I'm delighted. They're cute. <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Fong represent the last generation to have lived through the war. Their lives in very direct ways were transformed by it. But for the youth of today and the country in general, the war is a very distant memory. And yet in spite of this, like an earthquake, war has its aftershocks, effects that can be felt long after the violence has ceased. The Quang Tri province, which is about 550 miles to the north of Saigon, is a place of picturesque fields, beautiful rice paddies, and rustic villages. But back in 1975, this whole area was leveled by one of the fiercest bombing campaigns ever fought. But here's the real bomb. 10% of these explosives did not explode. I'm joining a group of brave disposal experts whose mission it is to find and destroy these death traps. I haven't been here long when the team finds their first bomb of the day. Oh, wow, yeah, yeah. It's a BLU-63, two of them. This one still has its fuse. This one is the most dangerous. I'm stood about less than half a meter away from two pieces of unexploded ordnance here. But it's only because these guys physically took me in to within less than a meter and pointed it out that I could actually see it. Otherwise, there's no way that you could spot this. You'd just walk straight past it. These cluster bombs, called UXO, or unexploded ordnance, might not look like much, just a rusty relic from the past. But the truth is, they're very powerful, high-velocity killing machines. So how do you get rid of one? By fighting fire with fire. Chuck Searcy is an American veteran and the man behind this whole operation. 50 years ago, he served with the US Army in Vietnam, but before it was even over, he had a sudden about face. When I first came here and began to realize the enormity of the problem, I began to say publicly that we Americans and the US government uh, had a responsibility to step up and try to help the Vietnamese deal with these issues. Chuck founded Project Renew, an organization that aims to make Vietnam safer. But it takes a little expertise and some pretty big balls to work with bombs, which is why Chuck teamed up with this guy, Colonel Hong, a North Vietnamese officer who also fought during the war. Today, Hong is the leading bomb expert in Vietnam. Two former enemies have come together to solve this problem and save lives. Cleaning up every bomb and mine in this country is impossible. The real mission is how to make Vietnam safe. Watching these guys work is nerve-wracking. They do this every day and they're bloody good at it, but make no mistake, the danger here is very, very real. As bombs age, they become unstable. They can go off at any point. Use your finger to press this button first. Today, Colonel Hong is giving me the honor of triggering the detonation to dispose of this latest threat. This team has destroyed over 2,000 bombs, saved countless lives, and brought calm and hope to a ravaged region. So press, light comes on, countdown, boom. Mm. Yep. The detonators are all set, and the blast zone is clear. Take cover, take cover. Wait, do I press the black button before the light comes on, or after? <laughs> Central Vietnam, the Quang Tri province. Take cover, take cover, or oh, sit, sit now, OK? I'm with US vet Chuck Searcy and his team of bomb disposal experts seconds away from either lights out or live another day. Ooh. Wow. I think that was pretty successful. Uh, today there have been six calls so far. Six? Yeah. And it's not even one o'clock. Lunchtime, right. Even after the detonation, there is still a chance that the UXO is active. The disposal team will check the area thoroughly before I'm allowed to inspect the blast site. This is the debris from after it has exploded. Hold it to see if it is hot. It's just uh, feel, feeling hot in our, in our hand. Yeah, that's still, temperature's still pretty high on that. As I'm standing here holding a cooling piece of shrapnel from a bomb that could have killed not just a farmer today, but a Viet Cong soldier 50 years ago, maybe someone under Colonel Hong's command, maybe the Colonel himself, 
It's hard to overstate just how remarkable this moment is, both for the lives of these two former adversaries and the future of this country and its people. In the past, you would hear only that the Viet Cong were horrible, cruel, but today you are sitting at the same table with a Viet Cong. I think that he is a person with a heart. Even though his efforts seem small, they are extremely significant to the lives of Vietnamese people. I think nearly every American veteran who comes back to Vietnam has a very moving and emotional experience from the Vietnamese. They, they don't forget the past, but they are not trapped in the past. And they look to the future, and together we are building a better future for uh, children of Vietnam and a safe future. After 50 years, there are still traces of the war to be seen. But Chuck and Hong are showing how this country is able to forgive and move on. And it's time for me to move on too. I'm leaving behind the lush countryside of the Quang Tri province and heading to the coast and the city of Hue. Located right in the center of Vietnam, Hue has long been the bridge between the conservative north and the liberal south, a melting pot of the old and the new. At one time, Hue was home to the ruling UN dynasty until 1945 when Ho Chi Minh kicked them out. Today, the fabulous Empress Palace is a huge tourist attraction. Now Hue is a thriving city, a place of art, culture and food not seen elsewhere in Vietnam. I'm meeting historian Vin at the amazing Emperor's Palace for a stroll around the grounds and a quick overview of the city of Hue. What is the historical significance of Hue? Hue used to be the capital of Vietnam. It was the capital of the Nguyen dynasty. So Hue used to be a cultural and political and educational center of the whole country. And during the war, uh, Hue, it was one of the three big cities of the South, including Saigon, Da Nang, and Hue. And Hue is near to the 17th parallel, the borderline between North and South. So this is a very uh, important city during the war also. How important is Hue? today for the Vietnamese people and the culture? After 40 years, a lot of change, but Hue is still an important city. Uh, it is a big city in the center of Vietnam and it's still a, a cultural center of Vietnam. And one of the reasons the tourists come is for the food. In the 1800s, there was an emperor named Gia Long, perhaps the original pretentious foodie. He was intolerant, demanding, and never wanted to eat the same meal twice. So he ordered a raw menu to be prepared consisting of literally 1,000 new dishes, a new dish a day for a thousand days straight. And so what was surely a miserable, grueling existence for the royal chefs became the foundation for one of the world's great cuisines and made Hue the food capital of Vietnam. A designation that has survived war, revolution, and the arrival of McDonald's. And running right through the center of Hue is the Perfume River a broad, slow-flowing river that wraps itself around the city like a lazy anaconda on a tree branch. If you want to travel around Hue, the river is one of the best ways. This river is the main artery to life here in Hue. This boat, these are your taxis, your restaurants, your family vans. Imagine taking your children to school in one of these every day. As well as being the main transport hub, the Perfume River is also the local supermarket. The city is only a few miles upriver from the ocean, and the water here is a rare mix of salt and fresh. Fish, shrimp, lobster, clams, all come up fresh from the river. Ready access to all that the Perfume River has to offer is just one of the things that makes this place, the Dong Ba Market, one of the most famous markets in all of Vietnam. If it walks on four legs, swims in the Perfume River, or grows in the ground, the Dong Bar Market has it fresher and more plentiful than any other market in the country. This market is uh, the center of Vietnam, traditional market, and uh, we got of, around over 100 years. Meet the Lay Brothers, 
they're rising stars in the burgeoning avant-garde art scene in Hue. Their work often centers on political themes and performance art. And when they're not painting random stuff red, covering each other in yarn, or doing, well, whatever this is, they love to eat and spend time at Dongbar Market. How many times do people eat a day in Vietnam? Most of people they eat three times, morning, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Right. But in Hue, but in Hue, yeah, people eat, you know, eat many, many times. Many time. Why? Because they, 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 they lie, they yeah, lie, you yeah, know, yeah. like higher people. The king, the king. Oh, because of the king, emperor. King culture, yeah. 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 Okay, so you say the food culture is all because the king wanted to have a different yeah, yeah, menu every day. Good food and uh, nature food, uh, no, not no, chemical. No, no chemical. No organic. Yeah, no yeah. China. No China. Yeah, 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 yeah. Talking to the ladies is kind of like watching their performance art. It's kind of smart, kind of weird. And 90% of the time, I have really no idea what's going on. Even we have the different weather, and Hanoi and Saigon, we cannot get connected to grow up. So the weather's different here as well? Yeah, of course. Yeah, very and that's what makes Hue so special? Yeah. Of course! <laughs> I knew I'd get there. You, <laughs> just, you, yeah, just, yeah, you yeah. just have to give me a few moments. I, I, have, I get there eventually. Yeah, yeah. All right, we're done. It's a wrap. <laughs> Hanging out with the Lay Brothers here in Hue has got me thinking about the future of Vietnam. In their 2010 short film, The Bridge, the brothers explore a favorite theme of their art, the reuniting of North and South Vietnam. It only seems appropriate that they reside in this bridge city, a place connecting North to South, a place of old cuisine and new art, where the wounds of the past are being... Man, what is going on here? Oh, those crazy artists. It's hard to understand exactly what's going on in their head, but one thing that is easy to understand is food. And Hue's reputation as a food city is further bolstered by its many outdoor restaurants and street food stands. Ton and Hai refuse to let me leave town without trying their absolute favorite dish. This looks delicious. And it is a pork, pork. and it's fresh. Yeah. 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 So here it's from the, the rice. Oh, it's a wrap it in. Uh, yeah, show, me, show me, show me, show me. Yeah, show me. Show me. Nem Lui is a traditional street food dish, as ubiquitous in Hue as a dirty water dog is in New York. You've done that before, haven't you? Yeah. It's basically a lemongrass pork sausage skewer wrapped in rice paper with some greens and sprouts to round things out. That's made with love. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. When most people think about Vietnam, they think about... Most of them, most of them don't know about Vietnam. They know about Vietnamese war. war. They don't know about Vietnamese development, yeah. culture. Do you think people in Vietnam still think about the war? Uh, the war is the part, it's not important for me. The past is the past. In the future is the future. Do you think most people think like you? Right now, uh, most people think about the same as uh, Yeah, yeah, they life. want to forget and make a new life. We don't want to have hurt. We want to be uh, happy right. and say, check the hand and be happy. The Lay Brothers, representing the spirit of a new Vietnam, unencumbered by the baggage of the past and moving forward towards the future. It's time for me to hit the road again, or should I say, the air. I'm moving on from Hue to the island paradise of Halong Bay, the flashpoint to the Vietnam War and the site of some of the most breathtaking scenery money can buy. the rock formations starting to spring out of the water in the bay. Wow, look at this. <laughs> For most people, Vietnam is a land of overrun bustling cities, sputtering mopeds and sprawling rice paddies. But my next destination totally flips that view on its head. It's not long after the wheels leave the tarmac that the verdant green of the rice paddies gives way to the blue-gray ocean. And then my destination appears out of the mist. I'm heading to Halong Bay, a breathtakingly beautiful rock maze of nearly 2,000 limestone towers that some have said should be the eighth wonder of the world. 
About an hour's flight from Hanoi, Halong Bay, and its giant cast formations jutting out from the water are unlike anything I've seen. Wow, look at this. <laughs> I have never seen anything like this in my entire life. It's also where the whole Vietnam War kicked off. It was a heated exchange between a destroyer, the USS Maddox, and a Vietnamese torpedo boat that escalated tensions and ultimately led to the US putting troops on the ground. It all ended on a rooftop in Saigon. But out there, past Holland Bay and international waters in the Gulf of Tonkin is where it all started. But that's all ancient history now, and I want to see what's going on here today. The beauty about being in a seaplane the whole ocean is your runway. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. To arrive in Halong Bay like this is pretty amazing. The beautiful scenery is not all it has to offer. There's tiny secluded beaches, floating bars and restaurants, and world-class scuba diving. And the reason I came here, Vietnam's premier rock climbing venue. I'm here to go rock climbing, which sounds all very well and good until you learn I had a pretty serious accident many years ago doing this very sport. And that nearly killed me. I've not actually climbed since that day, so I'm not sure how this is gonna go. Short of ditching my production team and hijacking the seaplane, it kinda looks like I'm gonna have to face my demons. As I arrive at my destination, surrounded by all the towering rock, I barely notice my guy, Tom, a fellow Brit, come out to meet us. He might not be local, but he's helping Vietnam realize its potential for tourism. What brought you to Halong Bay? I wanted to see more of the world. I was traveling, so I decided to travel around Asia, and I was making climbing one of my sort of focus points. And when, uh, when I got into Vietnam, I headed over to Halong Bay to to check out the climbing here. I mean, it's a no-brainer. I can see why you're it's here. Plenty I mean, rock, it's, yeah. it's, 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 plenty, <laughs> it's plenty of rock, yeah. It's plenty of rock, and it's absolutely stunning. <laughs> Tell me about the type of people that are climbing around. Is it just Westerners and foreigners, or is it actual people from Vietnam that are coming from around the country or too? There's more and more people coming through, um, Vietnamese uh, people. Um, on our staff, we have, we have a couple of, of brothers who are easily the best climbers among us. Um, and then we have tourists, um, we take a lot of people, and this is their first experience of rock climbing. Um, and then we have a lot of people who are doing similar sort of thing to me and coming around, travelling around Asia and hitting up each, uh, each different climbing spot. All right, I've, been, I've been chatting for long enough, I've got a bit of fear going on, I must admit, because of this accident about 16 years ago, so um, I think I've just got to knuckle down and get up this thing. I think you're going to do all right, you're going to have a lot of fun. <laughs> Thanks for the very <laughs> Twenty years ago, I fell while climbing in the UK. A boulder crashed onto my leg, pinning me to the ground for three hours. My father pleaded with the doctor not to amputate and save my leg in doing so. OK, mate. Let's go for it. Let's get you tied in. I'll make sure we do a good knot. <laughs> That's very reassuring. Thank you. Now, now you know I'm 230 pounds. So. It's, it's no problem. Halong Bay has a reputation for some of the most beautiful rock climbing you'll ever find in the world, but not necessarily the safest. The limestone can become soft and crumbly, meaning the holds are not necessarily the most secure, and the anchors need constant monitoring to make sure they remain sturdy. Now Tom and his climbing school is one of the best, but that voice in your head that says all the stuff you don't want to think about right now, that guy is screaming at me through a bullhorn. Okay, Climb when you're ready. I'm at the bottom of a hundred foot of sheer baking limestone rock. If I can overcome the buckling knees, sweaty palms and racing heart and clamber to the top of this beast, then I can finally put the pass to rest and maybe do a victory lap. But if I quit and get lowered to the ground, then I will forever in the eyes of the crew and indeed myself have to suffer the shame and humiliation of failing to do something that hundreds of tourists achieve every year. A little bit anxious, but you know, it's good to be back up here. It's tough, you, you underestimate just how, just how exhausting climbing can be. 
especially when you add the fear factor to it, which I've got a little bit off at the moment. All right, just keep me tense, Tom. When you're 70 feet up, certain death is only prevented by the rope tied to my waist. And the nice young chap holding it. Oh, the adrenaline's going, I gotta say. So it looks like after all that fear and anxiety and procrastination, I'm actually gonna make it up to my goal. What an experience. After so long, and after that major accident, to get back up on the rock face. The only question is, how am I going to get down? Hanoi, Vietnam's capital. In many ways, it's the opposite of Saigon. Conservative, traditional, slow. The cranky uncle to Ho Chi Minh City's hip nephew. All the old guard are up here, not quite ready to give up their old values, but still enjoying all the new Western culture that's seeping in. Like Bob Dylan going electric, everyone complained about it until they realized how awesome it was. Or like this train line that runs east to the Long Bien Bridge. You have the old, the decrepit ramshackle houses of Hanoi's old quarter, and the new, a bright, shining new modern train rumbling right through the middle of it all. The old and the new, slugging it out. As far as neighborhoods go in Asia, this one doesn't look like anything different to many others that I've seen. What is incredibly unusual about this place is that you can catch the 1210 from Saigon and come right down the middle of this neighborhood. And the people that are stuck in the middle of this culture war are the young, the artists, the new voices and the visionaries. Up here, censors still monitor art exhibitions, films, TV, books, CDs, and even comic books for transgressions. Imagine that. In the US, flashing some skin makes you a celebrity. Here, doodling cartoon boobs gets you an ankle bracelet. This is my latest work. It's called The Legend of Dragon General. It is a historical fiction about uh... Vietnam in the 13th century, where we have to face the invasion of the Mongolian army. This is Fong, and he is a dab hand with a pencil. He's one of the new breed of artists that are bringing comic books to the Vietnamese masses. And surprisingly, even for him, stories about ancient Mongo hordes can rub the censors up the wrong way. By publishing this book, we work directly with a government publishing house, and if they, they don't like uh, some, some of the detail in the books, we can uh, like uh, discuss about it, and we try to find a solution. Is there anything that you would love to be able to convey in your comic books now that you can't because of the censorship imposed on you? We haven't been censored uh, a lot in our latest book, but some part of the detail that we could not put in our book, it's quite a funny story. Like, for example, in this scene where the little girl see the cake in the, the, the shop, yeah. she was so excited that she grabbed her mom's boobs to get her attention. <laughs> but uh, when, when it gets to the publishing house, they say that it's sensitive and, and they don't think it's, it's suitable for publishing. So uh, they, they force us to cut it out. And so you can see that we have to redraw it like the kid is just uh, upset. It might not seem like much, but Fong and his youthful brethren are leading a quiet revolution here in Vietnam. All across the country, the youth are casting aside their country's traditional and communist values and redrawing the boundaries. The authorities are listening and slowly relaxing their control. I really hope in the future we can freely uh, like publish and express our idea because uh, we, we think it's uh, it's not a serious one, it's not a serious issue. Can you tell me why do you think 
the government's views are changing? Why do you think they're becoming more open to these ideas and this? I think it's, uh, it's, it's happened everywhere, not just in the publishing uh, industry. I think because of the new generation. When, when the younger generation gets to the important uh, position of the government, they, they may like affect the, the, the views of the authority to everything. I think most of the Vietnamese people, not just uh, youth generation, they are always trying to look forward. I think it's a positive way uh, to live and to look at things. So uh, yeah, most of the younger generation, they are pretty open and they, they are moving forward. And with such a skilled draftsman before me, how could I possibly pass up the chance to pose for a portrait? I've always been interested to see what I might look like being portrayed in a comic book, and I can't think of a better person to help me out with that than you. OK. <laughs> I'm getting flashbacks to high school. When you have a big nose like mine, these kind of hand-drawn cartoons can sting a little. And I'm wondering whether I won't need to do a little bit of censorship of my own. OK. <laughs> I hope you like it. That is amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm going to frame that. Thank yeah. you so much. Glad you like it. Oh, it's incredible. Where I'm going next is going to require nerves of steel, lightning reactions, pain resilience, and a never say die attitude. Where I'm going next is a place where I'm going to fight one of Vietnam's best. Now I'm a big guy, six foot five, 240 pounds. I've had military training, I box. You know, I can handle myself a little bit. And what I want to do is put myself to the test. Go toe to toe, eyeball to eyeball, in an epic bare knuckle, no holds barred smackdown. So I've come here to meet one of Vietnam's premier martial artists, a lethal, ruthless killing machine that has destroyed countless cowering victims with deadly technique. This is Trinh Thi Tien. For over 30 years, she's been studying a special type of martial arts called Vo Vi Nam. For centuries, our ancestors used this type of fighting to defend against foreign invaders. Martial arts has been considered a man sport until Trinh came along. In 1987, she was recruited by the Vietnamese army to join their martial arts team. She went on to win several international titles. My uncle started teaching me Vo Vi Nam when I was six years old. Since then, martial art has been in my blood. Which means, whether it's her business or the ring, Trin knows how to kick ass. I've got to ask you a question. Yeah. Have you ever fought anyone my height or my weight before? Be honest. Not yet. You're not afraid? No. In martial arts, it is not important whether you're big or small. Even a small girl can, if she knows proper techniques, bring down a big opponent. Take you, for example. I'm very small and you are big. I can't wrestle you to the ground, but if I use other techniques, like striking you here, it's lights out, cowboy. <laughs> lights out, cowboy? I don't want to bust her bubble. But even if I go easy, I don't see how this can possibly end well for little Annie Oakley here. I want you to show me how you're going to take me down. Okay, when you go like this, yeah. here, ah, in your... All right. Ah. Where did you press? Oh, are you okay? Yeah, yeah, no, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> OK, that was a little unexpected, but any third-rate strip mall karate teacher can find a pressure point. <laughs> all righty, the gloves are coming off. Time to show Trin how we drop them at Gleason's. Put me. Are you hurt? No, no, I'm good. I'm good. Okay. And so it goes in Vietnam. Young, smart, ambitious people changing stereotypes here, putting Western expectations in a chokehold and body slamming them to the floor. <laughs> the Lay Brothers and their art, Trin and the martial arts, Fong and his revolutionary comic books, each makes up a small part of the youthful new dawn in Vietnam. And as I come to the end of my time here, I want to sit down with someone a little closer to my own age. Someone has lived here and abroad and experienced various lifestyles and cultures. 
Luckily for me, I have Vietnam's smartest bar owner with me to help me try and put together everything I've seen in this remarkable country. And if anyone knows anything about capitalism and communism, it's Duck Win. He left Vietnam in 1975 as a boat person, feeling the communist advance. For the next 20 years, he lived in the US, but returned to Vietnam in 2006. In America, it's always good and evil, black and white. Vietnam's not like that. It's always the various shades of gray. You probably saw those banners with the communist sayings and, and dictates and all that. Sure, it's there. But if you look closely, those banners are being sponsored by banks and, and new businesses. There's a little sponsorship bit there. And it is the combination of communism and capitalism, which is sort of, you know, obviously it's ironic, but it's funny. One lives with whatever one can, and so if you have to have a marriage between capitalism and communism, you do live with it. These days, Duck is a bar owner, a journalist, and a radio correspondent. Is he American or Vietnamese? Or maybe both. Either way, he knows his bourbon from his snake wine and has a unique perspective on Vietnam. The country is just full of young people doing things all the time. At my age, I'm riding a motorcycle around and energized by, by the young people here. They have this insistence on hope that Vietnam's always had. If you had any ounce of, of normal human being, you just give up. But these people don't, do they? They do not give up. And I feel Duck is just echoing what I've learned here in my travels. Not everybody in the South is happy to be ruled by Hanoi, living under a socialist regime. But today, it's the young people that are, and have been, reshaping Vietnam. As I walk around this firework display to commemorate 40 years since the end of the Vietnam War, it sinks in for me. Most of the people here couldn't care less about the war. This generation, the next generation, they care about the same kind of things you and I and a lot of people we know care about. Expressing ourselves with cool art, trying amazing new food, kicking ass and scaling new heights. Okay, maybe not this kind of thing, but hey, this is the new Vietnam. Anything goes, right?